Good morning, church. So glad to be in the Lord's house this morning. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. Would you stand with us as we turn our minds and hearts to our Heavenly Father this morning? Light of the world, you step down into dark. Open my eyes, let me see. Beauty that made his heart adore you. Hope of a life spent with you. So here I am. State of Baptist Church. It's my joy and privilege uh, to welcome you to the Lord's house today. We're here to worship Him and praise His wonderful, matchless, don't even have all the adjectives to say how great He is, but uh, we're just here to worship Him and hope you'll just join in with us and worship Him. If you're online, we hope you'll just worship with us also. If you're a guest here, there's a little blue card there in the pew rack. We just ask you to fill that out and drop that into one of the offering boxes. And we just want to say thank you for being here. And if you do, we'll donate $5 in honor of you to our local Joy Clinic, which is a ministry here that ministers to people in our area that do not have health insurance or dental insurance, but most of all, they'll share the gospel and the love of Jesus with them. And so let me just uh, remind you why we exist. We exist here to reach people with the gospel and then help you to become fully trained disciples to come to love God, find community, impact the world, and make disciples. And we're just so glad uh, to have you here this morning. Also, let me just remind you, uh, Saturday, 1030, we'll be doing Lawrence 316. We'll be going out praying and going out into some of our neighborhoods and praying for people and and inviting people to church, so we'll meet in the Life Center. That'll be Saturday, 1030. We'll just go out for an hour or so. We're not asking you to go out all day, just for an hour. It's nice weather now, um, so uh, we'll be going out this Saturday, 
next Sunday is homecoming, celebrating 134 years uh, of being uh, in kingdom work right here on this road. And so we'll be celebrating next week. We'll have a lunch afterwards. Uh, we'll provide the meat. You bring all the other stuff. You know how it goes. And so invite someone, invite them to lunch, uh, and then we have a great time just celebrating what God has done and what God wants to do in the future here. And so looking forward to what God is going to do. Then also uh, October 21st, uh, if you can help out or at least pray for us, we'll be feeding the West Lawrence High School football team that Friday uh, afternoon. And so be in prayer for us that. If you want to help out, uh, donate stuff, call the office. You've probably got something in your life group. If not, it'll be there next week to just remind you on that. Okay? So we're looking forward to what God's going to do. And Brother Caleb, you lead us in prayer. Lord, we thank you for allowing us to come into your house this morning to just be with your people, just praise your name, and just worship you, Lord. I pray for all the people that aren't with us this morning, um, be it they're out of town or sick, Lord. I pray that you just be with them and you bring them back to us. I especially pray for the Hudgens family and um, Miss Betty with her mother. Lord, we thank you that we had the assurance knowing that she is with you now and that she's up there praising and worshiping you, Lord. And we just thank you for that peace that we can have when our loved ones pass on from this earth. Lord, I pray for the praise team this morning. Pray that um, we're just a blessing to the congregation and that um, that people can worship you through the music, Lord. I pray for Brother Brad that um, you just give him the words to say and that you would open our hearts, that we would be open to whatever you have for us this morning, Lord, and that we would take it out this coming week and just live out your word to a world that needs to see it and needs to hear the gospel, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Brother Caleb. Would you stand with this church? Soon and better soon we are going Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. The King. Hallelujah. Praise him this morning, church. Let's don't get too comfortable. Don't get too comfortable down here. You don't know when he's coming, do we? What a fellowship, what a joy divine. On the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine. On the everlasting arms.
All God's people said, amen, amen. Thank you, brother Sam and band for leading us in worship. All right, kids, time for Children's Church. Pray for a lot of kids. A lot of them are sick and some are well. Praise the Lord. Give me a better one than that. There you go. All right. So uh, pray for them. If you do need an outline, raise your hand and Brad or Scott will get you one. Uh, if you need an outline, just raise your hand. They'll get you one. Down here front. Uh, if you do, like I said, you can give in the house in one of the boxes uh, in the front or in the back. You can uh, drop it off at the office, put it in the mail, do online giving. If you can do that, I encourage you to do that. Uh, and just be faithful uh, in your giving because then God takes that money, whatever you give, and then uses it to spread the gospel all over the world. And that's why we give because, number one, God's called us to, but then God takes that money and uses it to spread the gospel and take it to the people that we may never, ever see till we get to heaven. And so, uh, and so again, thank you for being faithful to give. So let's go, Lord, in prayer, and we're going to dive into God's word. Father, we come before you and we just thank you that you sent your son Jesus to shed his blood for us so that we might have eternal life. As we just sang, he's the way, <laughs> the truth, and the life. He is the only way and the only truth and the only life. And Father, I pray if, if someone has not come to meet your son this morning, whether in person or online, I pray today would be the day where they receive him as Lord and Savior. But Father, as we open up your word, Father, may you guide me through uh, your word. Help me to say only what you want said this morning. 
I need your Holy Spirit. We need your Spirit to speak to us. So cleanse my tongue. Fill me with your Spirit so that you might receive all the glory and the honor and the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. One day there was a self-righteous man who boasted to his Christian friend. He says, you know, I'm not such a bad fellow. There are many people out there worse than I. And his friend replied, well, apparently you're measuring yourself by the wrong standard. Apparently you're measuring yourself by uh, the prostitutes and the drunkards that you see down there on Skid Row. And you kind of feel quite satisfied by that comparison. He says, I understand. But his friend said, go and measure yourself alongside the perfect life of the Lord Jesus Christ and see how you make out. See, the Lord Jesus Christ is to be our standard. He's to be the plumb line for our lives. And He shows us where we fall short. Now today I want to talk to you about comparison. And many times comparison is a snare and a trap for your soul. Teddy Roosevelt said this, Comparison is the thief of joy. Comparison will steal your joy in your life. And so we're in this series, we're wrapping it up today, Identity. We're not in Romans 8, but I really think this text and this message applies to our identity. And just let, just recap, remind you, we've been in Romans 8, one of the greatest chapters in all the Bible, talking about that spiritual passport. And just remind you, man, once you surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, man, it is stamped in Christ Jesus You're no longer under judgment. You've been delivered from the power and penalty of sin. Now you're under new authority. He goes on to say you're what? Remember, don't remember. You're a child of God. You're an heir of God. You're co-heir with Christ. Okay? He's for you. He's not against you. The Holy Spirit intercedes for you. Jesus intercedes for you. And he wraps up nothing or no one. No one can do what? Separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus The goal of this message is what I entitled this, The Danger of the Comparison Trap. The Danger of the Comparison Trap. We're going to be in the Gospel of John, going to be in the last chapter, and this is what I want to talk about today. This This is the goal that I want you and I to understand. Don't compare yourself to other people, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't compare yourself to other people, but to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, the text that we're going to be into today, let me give you the context before we kind of read it, okay? This is an account of Peter uh, and the disciples, but Peter is with the Lord Jesus, and um, he's resurrected from the dead. But let me just kind of give you the, the running commentary before we get to our text. And start a... 21 peter decides hey uh, let's go fishing now what was peter's trade what was his business before he'd been called aside it was fishing and i think possibly maybe peter had thought well god's not going to use me no more i denied him three times let's just go back to fishing i know how to do fishing i can do fishing and i can make a living and we can go about doing it and they'd been fishing all night if you remember the story they'd been fishing all night and it caught nothing and jesus from the shore he says hey why don't you throw out your net on the right side of the boat they're like what and john says hey peter i think that's the lord so they threw out the net on their right side of the boat and peter saw his lord if you read it he basically takes off his shirt and he starts swimming to shore to see jesus And he gets there, and as they're bringing the boat in, uh, they didn't catch one fish. It says their net was overflowing with 153 large fish. And then Jesus says, now, hey, hey, y'all come on. I got breakfast already served here for you. And so we've got the context. And then look at what happens after they ate breakfast. Verse 15 says, when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus asked, Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said to him. You know that I love you. Feed my lambs, he told him. 
A second time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, he said to him, you know that I love you. Shepherd my sheep, he told him. He asked him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Now Peter was grieved that he asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. Truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you would tie your belt and walk wherever you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands, and someone else will tie you and carry you where you don't want to go. He said this to indicate what kind of death Peter would glorify God. Now, if you don't know, Peter uh, was crucified upside down. And he asked to be crucified upside down because they were going to kill him. They were going to crucify him. But he didn't think it was worthy to be crucified upright because his Lord had been. So what does he say? After saying this, Jesus told him what? Follow me. Asked the Lord, who's the one? So Peter asked him, who's the one that's going to betray you? And when Peter saw, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about him. And so Peter turned around and he saw the disciple. He, he looked at John. And he says, what about him, Lord? And Jesus says this, if I want him to remain until I come, Jesus says, what is that to you? As for you, he says what? Follow me. So this rumor spread to the brothers and sisters that this disciple would not die. Yet D Jesus did not tell him that he would not die. But if I want him to remain until I come, he says what? What's that to you? And so you see Peter here comparing himself. What about John? What about, what about my brother? See, do you compare yourself to others? See, is your joy being robbed because you're comparing yourself to other people? That's not what God has for you. They want to give you three main truths, really four main truths, and then we're going to hammer some uh, uh, application out here. So number one, uh, just buckle up. we got a ways to go. So got a lot to give you, So, but we all live here. So let's just be honest. Let's just, I, you can already sense the tension in there. All of you are going to get nailed to the wall. So just go ahead. We're fine. Because we've all given into this comparison trap somewhere, sometime in our life. But may we learn from it. So number one, the temptation of comparison is a great trap that keeps you from experiencing God's plan for your life. <coughs> you know, Peter's like, well, what about him? What's going to happen to him? So Peter's playing the comparison game, and it's a great trap. Thomas J. DeLong, who's a professor at the Harvard Business School, he says he's noted recently there is a great trend in his students and his colleagues he calls a comparison obsession. He writes, more than ever before, business executives, Wall Street and analysts, lawyers, doctors, other professionals are obsessed with comparing their own achievements against those of others. We all, if we're not careful, we can have comparison obsession. It will affect our thoughts, our words, our actions, our decisions. I don't care whether you're an adult. I don't care whether you're a student, middle school, high school. Man, middle school, high school, that's where you live. It's all comparison. And it doesn't change once you become an adult. Don't let them lie to you. Because if we're not careful, we start we keep comparing ourselves even as we grow up as adults. Even pastors play the game. See, I told you, everybody. Well, how come he got a bigger church? Man, I know him better than him. How come he blessing their church, Lord? See. So it's very easy. And it's a trap that the devil loves just whoop, reeling us in with every day. 
Even students, when you start comparing yourself, well, they, they got this talent, they got this looks, they're in this group, they, blah, blah, blah. That's the problem with most in middle school and high school. It's drama. Where does the drama come from? Comparison. And when you buy into that, I don't care who you are, you're going to miss out on God's great plan for your life. You need to understand, comparison puts the focus on the wrong person. You're already focusing on the person. You need to be focusing on the person, Jesus. You need to understand you are unique. You're an image bearer that ought to glorify God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are one of a kind. You are God's creation. God only made one of you. And all God's people said, Amen. We're unique. He broke the mold with all of us. So we don't need to compare. You know one reason you don't need to compare yourself to somebody? Because you don't really know what's going on in their lives. Some of you used to be worried about people in high school. Then you found out at a 20-year reunion, man, they had a lot of junk in their life. And you wasted many years comparing yourself to that junk. See, don't give in to that. When you give in to that temptation, you miss out that God's got a great plan for your life. God wants to use you greatly for His kingdom. And so it's a great trap. And it's a sly trap, too. It's so easy for us to fall into. Peter fell into it right here. And if Peter can fall into it, we can, too. Number two, comparison can often be a trap that paralyzes you spiritually. It'll paralyze you spiritually. I mean, what is compare? Well, I'm trying to keep up with the Joneses. What is that? Well, that's a comparison trap. Look at what 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says. He says, For we don't dare classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. But in measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves to themselves, what? They lack understanding. When you compare yourself to others, that's not what God wants. You lack understanding. You lack the wisdom of what God wants for your life. So let me give you four ways that comparison will paralyze you. Number one, the power of comparison leads to sin. It actually started in the garden. What did the devil get Adam and Eve to fall into? Basically, comparison. Well, you got all this stuff. Man, they had everything. But what about this tree? This tree's got to be better than that tree. Man, you ought to be able to have that tree. And so the devil got them to bite. That's where our sin nature comes from. Because he tried to convince, you'll know more and you'll become what? Like God. It leads to sin, always. When you compare yourself to another student, another employee, another person, another pastor, or when you decide, well, I'm better than them, hey, it leads to sin. Today you have the deadly social media sin of comparisonitis. People go on social media, and you can be, you can be uh, sending up one down page and down the next because you're comparing yourself to that person or this person. Hey, come, they have that. Or look at what they're doing. They're bad, and this all leads to sin. When you buy into comparison, it leads to sin. Second, comparison distracts you from the Lord and proper priorities. It's going to distract you from the Lord. In proper priorities. Because, again, you've got your eyes on the wrong person. Remember the Pharisees? They were all about comparing themselves. Look, Jesus, I'm a lot better than that bum. Man, I pray every three times a day. I fast two times a week. I tithe more than that guy. Man, I, I, I'm it. That's comparison. What did Peter do? Well, Jesus, you just told me how I was going to die. Now, what about him? 
What about him? What did Jesus say? Just do what I told you to do. <laughs> that's paraphrased, but that's basically what Jesus told you. Do what I told you to do. Go feed and lead my sheep. See, what happens is, why do we play comparison? Just like the Pharisees, we want to be self-righteous. And when it's all about you being self-righteous, you have to build up your self-esteem to make you feel better than others. You and I all know people like that. They're always putting down people. Why? Because they're having to build themselves up because their identity is not in Christ, but their identity is in comparison. And when your identity is in comparison, you will be distracted from the Lord and His proper priorities, and you will always miss out on God's will because you're playing the wrong game. Number three, comparison leads to jealousy and resentment, which is more sin. Now, you should know this story. If not, you can probably go watch a YouTube um, you know, video of it, someone's display. But you remember Joseph? Jacob had 12 sons, but Jacob loved Joseph more. And when Joseph was 17, he gave him a very expensive coat of many colors. And, and he really... Jacob didn't do well. He wasn't being a good parent. He was showing more favoritism toward Joseph. And, and you remember Joseph had the two dreams, and he was a young whippersnapper, and he told all of his older brothers, hey, I had this dream, and you're going to bow down to me. And it, it did happen, but he did it in a prideful way, not saying, hey, this is what God told me. And if you remember what happened, it led to jealousy and resentment, and they hated their brother, and what did they do? They sold their brother threw him in the pit, then sold him into slavery. Didn't care nothing about him after that. See, comparison will always lead to jealousy and resentment. If not careful, you can buy into material comparison. It's like, well, I'm not really into material things. Well, if you're not careful, you can buy into relational comparison. You start, well, what about that? Right? How come they got that relationship? I don't have that. Or how come their circumstance is better than my circumstance? You know what part of the problem in the marketplace today is? The comparison trap. Because you're comparing yourself to one another while you're working when you need to understand, especially Christ, well, your boss is the Lord Jesus Christ. Greg Rochelle said this, the fastest way to kill something special is to compare it to something else. Don't compare it to anybody else. You want to compare it to anything? Compare it to Jesus. Number four, the sin of favoritism is birthed in our comparison of one group of people over another. The sin of favoritism is birthed in our comparison of one group of people over another group. We're going to go to James chapter 2. I'm just going to look at a few verses. I'm going to give you a broad stroke of the context very quickly, but you'll get what's going on here. In James 2, verse 1, it says this, My brothers and sisters, do not show favoritism as you hold on to the faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. And then James says, hey, when someone comes into your in your meeting, your worship service, and they got on fine clothes, they got on a $1,000 suit, and they drove up in a very expensive car, don't give them the best seat. And then someone walks in, and they walked in uh, with no money and ragged clothes. Don't put them back there in the back where nobody can see them. James says that's showing partiality. That's showing favoritism. Look at what he says in verse 8 and 9. He says, If indeed, if you fulfill the royal law prescribed in the Scripture, he says what? Love your neighbor as yourself. You're doing well. If, however, you show favoritism, you do what? You commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. James said, quit showing favoritism. Don't show favoritism based on their material wealth, their talent, their popularity, or the, the melanin count that they have on their skin. 
See, what you got to remember, everybody you see every single day, everybody in this building today has all been created in the image of God. Everybody. And the challenge for all of us, because culture, man, this, this verse, this, this right here, is our culture right now. Pitting this group over this group, that's what politicians do. Whereas every person you ever will see is created in the image of God and you're to treat them with the love of God because they were created in the image of God. Even if you say, well, what? they could be the most heathen person, but they were still created in the image of God. Just like you are. They need the same Jesus that you have. Number three. Third truth is God's plan for you is to avoid the comparison trap. <laughs> That's God's plan. He says, I want you to avoid this comparison trap. Someone said, and you think about this, a flower does not think of competing with the flower next to it. What does it do? It just blooms. What does God want you to do? Bloom where you've been planted. So let me give you three steps here and how to avoid this comparison contract, con comparison trap. Number one, find your identity in Christ, not in others. Why do we fall prey to the comparison trap? Because our identity, we're not totally grasping every single day that our identity is in Christ. So how, how do I come to be in Christ? Well, you, again, you've got to understand, it all started, I just mentioned Jan in Genesis 3, and because of that, we inherited sin nature, and we can't get to heaven on our own. But praise God, that's why Jesus came shed his blood, and died on the cross for all of us so that we might have eternal life. He was buried in the tomb, but he didn't stay there. But he rose on the third day to defeat death, hell, and the grave. And you can have forgiveness of sins. You can have a right relationship with God. You can be in Christ. How does that happen? You've got to come to a place where you turn from your sins and say, all right, Lord, I've been going the wrong way. Lord, I'm ready to follow you. And you put your faith and trust in him. How does that happen? You say, Lord... I'm at the end of my rope. I give you my life. I put my faith and trust in you. And I will follow you the rest of the days of my life. And once that happens, your identity is in Christ. Go back and read Romans 8. It'll tell you what God says about you now. <laughs> that you're a child of God. You're an heir of God. See, we, 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 we try to find our identity in so many different things. You know, growing up, my identity was more in athletics than in Christ. But did you know that there's a 0.003%? Your kid or grandkid will become a professional athlete. But I can promise you 100% they'll stand before Jesus Christ and have to give an account. Your identity is to be in Christ. It doesn't matter what people think of us, and that's very hard to know as teenagers. It's even hard as adults, to be honest with you. Sometimes we're more concerned what people think than what God thinks. We're more concerned what they said about us on social media or whatever app is out there. See, you just need to understand, especially... You teenagers and young adults, you got to understand. You're going to be tempted with this trap all of your life. Just don't give in. You don't have to give in. 
be yourself. Just be yourself. The quicker you understand that, the better you'll be. You know why? Be yourself. Everyone else is already taken. We don't need somebody else. We need you to be you in Christ Jesus. So find your identity in Christ. Second, focus on your love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Focus on your love relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, you might say, why did Jesus ask Peter three times, do you love me? Now, you need to understand, English cannot translate sometimes the Greek words perfectly. Now, we have, what, one word for love. The Greek language had three and really four. And so, in the beginning here, when Jesus says, do you love me? He's using the Greek word agape, a God-like love, a Christ-like love. Peter says, I phileo you. You ever heard of the city Philadelphia? It was named that. It's no longer that. <laughs> city of what? Brotherly love. And so Jesus twice is saying, do you, do you, do you have that Christ-like love, that God-like love? For me, and Peter says, I phileo you, Jesus. I love you as a brother. And then the third time, Jesus says, all right, do you phileo me? And he says, yes, Lord, you know I do. Why did he do that? I think to build Peter up and remind him, I still want to use you, but then what did he do? He gave him three commands. He says, Peter, I don't want you to go back fishing. He says, what? He says, I, I want you to feed my lambs. I want you to shepherd my sheep. I want you to feed my sheep. I want you to realize that I still want to use you. Your identity is in me. See, you and I need to understand the same thing. Our identity is in Christ. I don't care what you did in the past. We've all messed up, screwed up. But God wants to use you today and tomorrow. And where does that come? From focusing on your love relationship with Him. Henry Blackby says this, a love relationship is with God is more important than any other single factor in your life. You know what the most important thing in your life is the love relationship with Lord Jesus Christ. It's more important than your job. It's more important than your family. It's more important than how much money you have. It's more important than how many social media followers you have. The most important thing is your love relationship with Him. Because if you don't have that, nothing else matters. But if you do have that and you focus on that, everything else will be fine. But if you don't focus on it, even as a Christ follower, you'll fall prey to the trap and everything else will come crumbling down. You've got to focus on that relationship. Love him no matter what. Make him priority. Say, well, what if I mess up? There is forgiveness, praise God. And God says, all right, I forgave you. Now keep going. I clean the mud off. Let's go. This is what he says in my vernacular. He says, focus on that relationship. Find your identity in him. Third, Follow Jesus and find comfort in His Word. Follow Jesus and find comfort in His Word. Twice in this command, Jesus commands Peter, follow me, follow me. And again, Peter's like, he's comparing himself to John here. What about Mr. Faithfulness here, John? What, what about him? And Jesus says, John's responsible for John. Peter, you be responsible for Peter, and both of you follow me. That's what he's telling us. Quit worrying about them. Follow me. You got enough issues in your own life. Give it to me and follow me. Don't worry about them. I'll work in their life too. Swindoll said this, when the Lord makes it clear you're to follow him in this new direction, focus fully on him and refuse to be distracted by comparison with others. 
Even if you decide, man, today, Lord, I'm going to follow you more than I ever before, there's still going to be a distraction. The devil will try to get you distracted. He'll even, dis- even try to distract you by comparing yourself. Oh, well, Lord, man, I'm really walking more closely than they are. Sin. See how easy it is to do? Lord, I get more time than they do. I come to church a whole lot more than them. I'm always serving more than they do. See how easy it's very. The devil's really sly. You got to follow him. Find your comfort. Engage with God's word. What do you mean by engage with God's word? Read with God's word, but allow God's word to change your thoughts, your behavior, your actions, and your lifestyles. may not realize it, but 91% of Generation Z doesn't even engage with God's Word. 4% of them have a biblical worldview. So who's Generation Z? Let me just give you the ages. Anybody from 12 to 25 is Generation Z. Generation Alpha is 11 and under. Generation Z makes up now truly the first post-Christian generation. Generation Alpha has more material things and technology than any generation ever before. You need to understand both of these generations find most of their meaning from an online world. But Jesus said, where do we need to find meaning? Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but what? By every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. You want to avoid this comparison trap? Follow Jesus. Do you engage with his word? Find your identity in Christ. And focus on your love relationship with him. Then the fourth truth, and I want to, this is going to be application right here. And this is application for adults. I want us to pray for those in the next generation, that would be Generation Z and Generation Alpha, who are bombarded with the comparison trap. Us in the house are adults. We should know how to avoid the comparison trap, and if you don't know, I just showed you how. (laughs) And you should be able to pick up on it very fast. And I'm going to hit you with a bunch of stuff very fast, okay? But if you do not realize what our next generation is being bombarded with, you need to understand. They're being bombarded with a transgender agenda. They're out to get our children. They're out to get our students to be dissatisfied with their appearance, to get dissatisfied with their image, their identity. Oh, you just need to have a transgender surgery and everything will be right because now your identity will be right. They're getting bombarded with lies from the devil everywhere they go. They're bombarded with wrong pronouns. They're bombarded with lies. You need to understand they're being assaulted with post-Christianity spirituality. They are being taught Christianity is outdated. God's dead, as I told the group on Wednesday night. There is a rising interest in the occult, and they're going after your kids and grandkids. Whether you... Whether you want to admit it or not, they're coming after our kids. God is out. Ghosts and spirits are in. Gen Z is into tarot cards. They have a growing interest in the supernatural and the occult, but they have no interest in the Bible. There's a spiritual vacuum in the Generation Z. They get most of their spirituality from TikTok. They're getting their theology from TikTok, which is a, if you don't really know, you need to understand, it's a communist China app, which the Chinese don't even allow their kids to see that app. It's being filled between a TikTok spirituality, the occult, liberalism, secular humanism, 
is being shoved down our throats. They're growing up hearing that critical race theory, intersectionality, diversity, equity, and inclusion are, is the new gospel. They're being bombarded with a false gospel which says, you be you. You do you. Self is at the center of that. They're influenced by thinking like this. What is true for you is true. But what is true for me is true also. Even though they can be 180 degrees opposite. See, truth is relative. They're taught that. Truth is relative to whatever you want it to mean. So let me give you some stats, reason you need to pray for these two generations. Seven out of ten teens struggle with anxiety and depression. Actually, four out of ten adults do. 35% of U.S. teens have contemplated suicide, and suicide is at a rising clip in our teenagers. They're committing suicide at vast clips today. Look at this stat. 60.2% of Americans, 12 and over, struggle with substance abuse. They're bombarded with anything and everything. You need to understand, Generation Z is the first generation raised in a post-Christian context. If you have kids that age, man, and you raise them in a Christian context, you need to understand you're one of the few out there. Most of this generation has no memory of the gospel. Most of you in the house grew up in a house where they maybe took you to church and taught you the Bible truths, and brought you to vacation Bible school, and there was actually a gospel truth out there in the community. No gospel for those that generate. That, most of them have no memory of the gospel. They have no clue who Jesus is. Generation Alpha, man, they are pushing a homosexual transgender agenda down their throats. Now, I'm going to be through in a minute. You can do what you want to do with your kids because they're your kids. It's your call. It's not mine. Because you'll be accountable before God. But I'll be accountable for preaching to you the truth. If you want to take them to a Disney movie and feed them a bunch of this transgender, homosexual agenda, you go right ahead. Because your kids will buy into it like Kool-Aid. And they're shoving it down our kids' throats. 20% of Gen Z indi indicate themselves as LGBTQ. Did you know why they're doing all these surgeries? One, they want to castrate your kids. But it's a $5 billion industry now. They're indoctrinating our kids left and right. They want to shove this evil agenda down their throats so they'll be so confused that they won't know right from left, male from female. They already think there are 58 genders instead of two. Now they're trying to teach them that men can have babies. Yeah, that's right. We know that's crazy. But it's going on. What are we to do as a church? I mean, we're to come alongside, do whatever we can to pray for you, to help you parents, help you grandparents. Why? Because their lives matter. And the devil wants to suck them into hell as fast as he can get them. And our job is to preach the gospel to them. And to love them into the kingdom. Because they're just, man, this comparison trap, they're hitting them from every side. And you've got to remember, people are like snowflakes. No two are exactly alike, even though we've got a lot of snowflakes out there shoving this stuff down our kids' throats. Remember, comparison. It is the thief 
of joy. Man, you compare yourself to others, it brings about despair. So what I'm going to challenge you to do today, challenge you over a year ago. I'm going to challenge you to adopt a child, adopt a student in our church, not one of yours. If you ain't praying for your children, may God nail you to the wall today. And may you start interceding for them like never before. But as a church, I'm going to ask you in the invitation, or maybe you don't want to come in the invitation, maybe you want to come later, I'm going to have some cards down here. I'll have some down here on this, and I'll have some on here, and basically all this going to say is it'll have somebody's name, it'll have their parents' name, you say, what am I to do? Well, this is what I'm going to challenge you to do. You need to pray for them. You need to start interceding for them. Say, how much? As much as you can. Now let me just say, if you're a parent in the house, how many of you would want some people to pray for your kids? You grandparents in the house, how many of you want somebody to be praying and interceding for your, your grandkids? I think you'd want some people to say, hey, what are we to do as a church? We're to come alongside and say, all right, we'll do whatever we can. You're the one that has them all the hours. We're here to pray and help you and do everything we can so they don't get sucked into this comparison trap and fall prey to the devil. It's my hope and prayer all of us realize we don't have to live in this trap. I hope you'll realize you can have joy. You can have full meaning. God's got a God wants to use you every single day in whatever you do. God has gifted you. God wants to use you. I don't care who you are. You might say, well, there ain't much I can do. I like getting the seat preached, but do not. that's a lie from the pit of hell. Are you alive today? Can you pray today? You're the most important person in the room. You are the most important person in the room. What does this child need? Is someone going to the throne and praying for them? They got parents. Probably got grandparents. This one does. But it needs somebody else praying. Because just because he's got parents and grandparents don't mean the devil's not going to come after him. You need to understand, yes, we live in Lawrence County. This ain't Lawrence County 60 years ago. This is Lawrence County with the devil wreaking havoc through the whole county. And if he can sweep in your kids and grandkids, he's like, let's do it. So always, find your identity in Christ. Adults, where's your identity? If you know Christ, it's in Christ. If you student, it's in Christ. You child, you know Christ, it's in Him. Don't compare yourself to others. We've all done it. Compare yourself to Christ and follow Him. Let's pray. Father, we just come to You. First, we're just grateful that You offer to us eternal life. Father, if there's someone here today that has never, ever surrendered a life to you, I pray today would be the day. You might be online. You might be in person. It doesn't matter. But you know without a shadow of a doubt, if you died right now, you wouldn't go to heaven. I encourage you. Give your life to Christ. Call on Him. 
Maybe pray this prayer with me. It's not about a perfect prayer. It's really about the genuine desire of your heart. And if you're ready to follow Him, just pray something like this. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I've blown it. I've been going the wrong direction. But God, I really do believe that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. He was buried in the tomb, but he rose again on the third day, and he's alive and living today. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, to come into my heart right now. Forgive me of all my sins. Be my Lord, Master, and Savior from this moment on. Thank you, Lord, for saving me, calling me, and accepting me. In Jesus' name, amen. All eyes closed, nobody looking around. Somebody maybe pray that prayer with me this morning. If you did, just kind of raise your hand, anybody. If you did online, please let us know. Father, I pray for every Christ follower. Father, forgive us when we, we get entrapped in playing this comparison game. But Father, help us to find our joy, our meaning, our identity in you. And Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters that you would remind them of these many truths that we saw over the last several weeks. Father, I thank you that nothing or no one can ever separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And so, Father, we just give you this time. We give you this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. We're just going to have a time of invitation, time to respond to God. You may want to come and pray in the altar. You may want to come and get a card. I'll have some over there. I've got some in this pew. I'll put some on this um, podium here. Uh, if you don't feel like coming during the invitation, that's fine. Come get one after the service. You know what I'm saying? I'm not. We're not to be here comparing. Well, well, they went down, but I didn't go. Don't buy. see how easy it is to buy into that junk. You know what I'm saying? You're gonna sin before the invitation's over. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So don't do that. If you're like, I, I don't feel like getting up among those, those people, that's fine. That's fine. God knows what, you, what you're going to do. Just come and get one later. What's more important? You pray. You stand. You do what God tells you. Brother Sam will lead us. You come if you feel led to come. You do what God tells you.
God's people said. Amen. Again, thank you all. I know many of you prayed over the last year uh, for one or more of our kids, students. Again, you don't know how much that meant to them. And you probably won't know this out of heaven. You say, what can I do? If you want to let them know you're praying for them, you can do that. You do whatever the Spirit tells you. You may want to send them cards. If you want to do that, you do. You do whatever the Holy Spirit tells you to do. But the main thing is pray for them. God will bless that. You say, well, before you start comparing yourself, well, what about those people not here today? I'll get them next week. Because we got many that are sick, some out of town. We'll put cards out for them. They can adopt a child, okay? So before, I'm trying to help you out here. Because it is very easy to sin before you leave the house. So I'm trying to help you. But again, thank you all. Love you. Great Sunday, church.